Uh, my question is that um, thousands of people dying from earthquakes, uh, to the panel question, thousands of people dying from earthquakes can't be called God's punishment. Why is it that a person being saved from under the rubble days later is um, almost invariably called a miracle? It's, it's probably the stupidest thing the human race does is to look for patterns in this way and say when a baby falls out of a high-rise building and bounces on the grass below, that must be God. And when uh, millions of children die every day for the lack of pure drinking water and just die of diarrhea in a banal manner, that's because God moves in a mysterious way or isn't involved at all. So I think we're off to a racing start, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> on the key question, anyway. Natural disasters happen, and an omnipotent God lets them happen if, for those of us who believe in God. Uh, several leaders of the Christian church, as you know, said about the last tsunami that it was a punishment. In Britain, several of them said it was a punishment for homosexuality. Um, uh, that, it used to be said uh, that uh, earthquakes were a punishment for sodomy. Since we're doing sodomy in the lash, I thought I might as well bring this up. <laughs> Oddly enough, the San Francisco earthquake only hit when San Francisco was famous for other things. <laughs> When New Orleans got flooded, the only bits that didn't get flooded were the red light district. Okay? So anyone who says they know God's mind in this had better not mind looking a bit foolish. Or, which you obviously don't, or had better say, take responsibility, take responsibility and say, yes, by letting it happen, God must in some way wish it to. Christopher Hitchens obviously has uh, got a lot of attention uh, from our audience, and here's a question aimed directly at him. Oh um, from Jessica Langrell. Uh, just another one to Mr. Hitchens. Um, you typically stereotype religious people as dogmatic and fundamentalists. No, I don't. Um, how is this when people who listen to you um, feel as if you're the one being dogmatic and fundamentalist in your evangelical pursuit to convert the world to atheism? Well, I have to... I would have expected more applause for a cheap point like that. <laughs> um, that's more like that. Now that's more like what I call applause, for a um, I will have to, uh, Tony, put myself in the safekeeping of your audience but tonight, uh, here, physically, and those who are watching, and ask them if they really think that's what I do or what I'm like. And that the reason the questions come to me, all of them, so far, is not just because of my sexual charisma. <laughs> um, but, but if it was that uh, all this, uh, that, that this description of me is dogmatic and my only uh, description of others as being dogmatic was true, then I wouldn't be able to correct it in the time of this show. We have one last question. It comes from Pam Collicott. Many non-believers facing death change their minds about religion. Is that fear or comfort? OK, we're going to have to have quick answers from everybody. Frank Brennan. It's often both. <laughs> I would say exactly the same. It's again what I said before, where there is no meaning, people find, find God. And they, that's their comfort. There's even supposed to be a God gene, I think someone thought of. And I don't understand it totally, and some part of me does. So, you know, I would say I agree with Frank. It's fear and comfort. Wally Daly. Well, let's not ignore it. It's a perfectly rational decision to make at that point. <laughs> <laughs> When you're on your deathbed, there's absolutely no point not believing in God at that point. Because uh, you might be right. You may as well jump on a team that, if it's wrong, who cares? You know? I, would, so, I would say God knows. I mean, you know, unless you're from a team that, you know, dies repeatedly. Yes. Isn't there, uh, could you... When Voltaire was dying, a priest came and said, you should renounce the devil, and he said, this is no time to be making enemies. <laughs> But it's a, it's a, it's a religious uh, falsification that uh, people like myself scream for a priest at the end. David Hume very famously didn't, didn't and was witnessed by, by James Boswell not doing so. Uh, most of us go to our ends with dignity. If we don't, and if it is uh, the wish for fear or comfort, then both of these things are equally delusory, as religion is itself. But I think one of the strengths of your book is that you do concede that religion is ineradicable. Oh, so, yeah. given that reality, I mean, I come back to the point, why not drop the bagging and smearing, and let's say the solvent is respectful public discourse. But you... We judge things by their fruits, and if there be arguments which are put, which are misconceived, then we talk that out. OK, hang well, on. Father, I'm you're the, soul, you're the soul of charity, but, I mean, who's been bagging and smearing? And you've said that twice. No. As if you're 
sitting there our only protection against a wave of smearing and bashing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that, I thought that if, as, as long as we have a civil conversation, we don't have to keep on saying that that's what we're doing. <laughs> Frank just talked about homosexuality as if the church had never condemned it as a mortal sin. Yes. Yes. I mean, yes. it's extraordinary. Um, I, I would not know that you were a member of the Society of Jesus, except that it was a very Jesuitical point you were making. <laughs> and concealed, <laughs> and concealed your main one. And I'm sorry, well, it is the same. The Islam says the same. You cannot be a good Muslim and publicly be homosexual. Why don't you, given the, given the wonderful freedom of a secular conversation, where no one's going to say anything about your right to say it, why don't you say what you actually think? How about that? <laughs> OK, yes, yes, and then I'd like to hear from Can I, can I just say that what I find interesting about your book, Christopher, is that everyone's the same, and yet we're all violently different. And if you are a cultural Catholic as I am, I don't listen to what the Pope says every day and take my guide from him. My mother, who's 84, says she had a, a Vatican bypass 30 years ago. You know, it, it isn't like you see. Maybe because you're not a believer, you don't understand that... Sounds within, like progress of a kind. With, no, but she, she converted from a, a completely non-believing family when she was about 20. But the, the thing is that... Religion is so manifestly pluralist as well. I mean, there's so many different ways in which people see God. And even within the Catholic Church, there's violently different um, ways in which people practice their faith. Did you say and violently? The idea... <laughs> I missed that. You did say violently. Well, violently. I know you well, I agree people. with you. I agree with you on all that that you say about violence among religion. And, and that's the point. There's a, I like the old Greeks and the Romans. You had a god of war and a god of peace. And, you know, you had different kind of gods. I like that. But the, the idea that we're all following the Pope, I think, is a bit misguided. OK, uh, I've got, I want to... You're well, either a Roman Catholic or not. You can be tons of kinds of Catholic. Oh, you'd be surprised. There are several... There are five Popes I know about. There's a Coptic Pope, there's an Eastern Pope... There's no, a, all right. Well, I'm most, talking about the one in Rome. not accepting the authority um, of the Holy Father, I, I leave it to uh, this Father. But, I mean, I think that's not... I think since about people who, 1969... People who take their faith a la and cafeteria style don't impress me very much <laughs> on the points of principle and conviction Look, that we're supposed to be Catholics talking about. if following the Pope, they'd all have ten children. They don't. Well, Frank that's a, Brennan, that's a, that's can a, that's I... That's a start, I, too. Can I, can I hear Frank Brennan on the... the, the progress of the, the, the fundamental point that uh, Christopher Hitchens made, which is uh, how can you say something which is clearly against the teachings of your church, clearly against the teachings of the Pope? I haven't said anything clearly against the teaching of my church <laughs> or against my Pope. Uh, I have drawn a distinction. So, but hang on a sec. Is, 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 homo is, is homosexuality a sin or otherwise? And is, if it is a sin, is it the sort of sin that would see you go to hell according to Roman Catholicism? No, uh, homosexuality is not a sin, it's a, it's a disposition. Uh, if you want to <laughs> argue. <laughs> If you want to argue about whether particular homosexual acts are appropriate for an individual in a moral context, that would require a pastoral discussion with that individual. What we were discussing previously was what should be the law in a civil society such as Australia where you have people of different religious convictions. And the question was whether or not there should be same-sex marriage. Now, that is not an issue which is resolved by determining what the Catholic Church says to its own members it regards as moral or immoral. They're quite distinct questions. So, on any question, whether it be homosexuality or it be anything, you will find a position that the, the majority take. And on the question of homosexuality, undoubtedly, if you, if you took a poll in the Muslim world, uh, you would find that most people would consider it sinful behaviour. But if you took... Dodging it. It's not the, what Muslims think, it's what Islam teaches. Yep. What God is is not so important, but what God, that idea of God, leads people to do. When the um, New Orleans tragedy happens, one of the, the most uh, heroic acts was the way the Salvation Army was, was there on the, on the spot. The minute it happened, I spent three and a half years going to Villawood Detention Centre and got very much involved, as Frank did, with the, re uh, the so-called illegal... Um, people that came to Australia um, without visas and trying to get them visas. When I went to the yard, which was a very unpleasant place to be in every week, it wasn't the Fabian Society or the Pacifist Society that was there helping people, but invariably it was older nuns, um, people who had some connection with the Anglican Church. We sat down, um, people who believed in Islam, people who believed in Christ, people who believed in uh, anything you could think of, and we were all kind of in the same boat together. But it was interesting how it was those that had some faith 
um, who had the time too, no doubt, who were there helping. And, and to me, it's was as this a private institution. Well, a private what institution? The one you were visiting was. I was visiting a detention centre run by the government. Um, people who came to us, or still, it's, it was a policy brought in by the Labor government and continued um, under the Liberal government and continues to this day. Now we take people to Christmas Island. Which and is off I'm the going coast. to interrupt you, and, and for a moment, and sorry, to interrupt thing. everyone just yeah. for a moment, because we actually have a question mm. uh, that's coming up that uh, that actually leads us in a similar direction. My question is to uh, Mr. Hitchens again: um, How do you account for? the uh, good work, uh, specifically regarding the title of your book, uh, Religion Poisoning Everything, uh, the good work done by uh, religious aid organisations overseas in third world and developing countries, as well as um, locally um, on our own shores and I'm sure in, in your country uh, with the homeless and the needy. Christopher. This is why, in the, towards the tail of the last question, I asked the lady from the Sydney Institute, uh, whether these institutions you're talking about... I'm Anne. <laughs> well, I don't know you well enough yet. I'll just introduce myself. Perhaps I'm we'll Anne. be more bonded by Some the end of the... Some would say not much of a lady. Be, we'll, be more, <laughs> we'll be more intimate by the end None of the... None of us <laughs> would say that. Well, I know people who would. <laughs> it's, just, it's just not the way oh, I was brought up. Yeah. Perhaps by the end of the <laughs> show we'll be more intimate. Um, well, I asked her about... Because she, she wasn't content just to say religious people volunteer for charities, if that was news to anybody. But she had to couple it with a smear against Fabianism and social democracy. Now, as a matter of fact... Well, they weren't the, there, Christopher. That's I'm all so I was sorry saying. to say I that without... The, no, the, effort, the, fa the efforts of Fabianism... But you're good at you, smears. The efforts of Fabianism... What's wrong with a smear? I, I don't... I'll get to the end of this sentence if it kills you. <laughs> <it'll>, um, <laughs> The efforts, the efforts of socialists and social democrats to make sure that things like education and health do not depend upon private charity given by rich people and religious institutions to the deserving poor are the reasons why a lot of it's taken care of because it's taken care of. Hang because on, I wasn't we have rich. welfare and... But just a minute, there's another smear. I wasn't a rich person giving charity where it wasn't gone. You have to understand I didn't the say problem. that you were. Well, it seemed to come across I didn't that even way. imply that you were. No, the, the efforts of Fabianism and social democracy, socialism, were to make sure that these things didn't depend on the voluntary whim. Yeah, but they don't do and that did, now. Or the idea of the deserving poor. Now, that's the first point. I know point. about The second things. point, uh, well... Because it's so taken for granted now, I love to remind people, actually, this but meant... That was a long time this ago. This meant social political action, as I you correctly say, as you quite correctly say, and I can help you out here by emphasising it, quite a while ago. Mm. That's why I said not to forget it. Now, to the point about religious activis activism, isn't it true, haven't you all heard, that Hamas does so well because it supplies social services? Are you going to say that it's the same is true for... Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Never mind that they're religious, they distribute services where otherwise there'd only be secularism and corruption. Well, if you want to claim that, you can't just claim the charitable part of it, it seems to me. Mother Teresa, endlessly praised for work that most of the time she actually never did. I went to watch her very closely in Calcutta. You don't mind that she thinks that what Bengal and Calcutta mainly needs is a campaign, a clerical campaign, against birth control and family planning. Has anyone here ever been to Bengal and concluded that's what it really needs? That's what she was really campaigning for, in case you're worried. But never mind. She gives a wonderful impression of being a charitable person. So what Indians need is more missionaries to cure poverty, when everybody knows there's only one cure for poverty, which is the empowerment of women, which means giving them some control over their reproduction. They <laughs> need... You name me a Catholic or Muslim charity that goes into the fields determined to secure the empowerment. Okay, of well, let, let's and you'll see, have the ghost of a point. Let's see if Frank Brennan. Until now, you don't. Let's see.